So hello and welcome to one of uh, the Future Social Service Institute's series of fireside chats. It's appropriate to have the fire today. It's been a cold and windy day. I've had a typical Melbourne morning of hail pelting my window through to sun now. So welcome um, and thank you for making time on the first day uh, out of lockdown number five here in Victoria. Um, I, my name is Michaela Cronin. I'm the director of the Future Social Service Institute and I'll be introducing our speakers in a minute. Um, but I'd like to first of all uh, acknowledge that we are meeting on Aboriginal land today and to pay my respects to Aboriginal elders, both um, of the past, uh, the present and those leaders who are emerging. The, this fireside chat is one in a series that is funded by Family Safety Victoria as part of uh, an investment in growing the leadership, uh, in the, particularly in the family violence sector. These sessions are opened broader than that, but the intention of these is to what can we do to help foster help strengthen existing leadership and encourage um, emerging leadership. So very much um, wanting to keep at the forefront of our minds that our First Nations people and that these the lands on which we are all working um, have never were never ceded. Um, so on, on that note, I want to introduce our two speakers, um, Sarah Broadbent and Kath Davis. We're very excited to have you both joining us today. I think that what what when we asked Kath and Sarah to, to do this conversation together, it's an acknowledgement that between the two of them, they have very extensive experience in in influencing from within and alongside and, and, we, and outside of government and government processes. So the intention is um, to 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 listen to the their experience and their wisdom together. Kath um, is the uh, currently the uh, government relations um, director, re government relations advisor to the vice chancellor at RMIT. Um, Kath, prior to that, for between 2015 and 18, was the senior advisor to the Minister of Disability, and has held. Uh, so has worked as an advisor within government. Prior to that was the Federal Women's Officer at the Australian Education Union for 11 years. So Kath has seen and worked both within and alongside government and is now in, a, in an advocacy engagement role. Sarah, Sarah Broadbent, thanks so much for joining us today. Um, Sarah's current role is the Director of the Workforce, Workforce Development and Demand in Jobs Victoria. And we've worked very closely with Sarah on, on, a, on a range of projects that have been um, particularly um, driven by the Working for Victoria program. So Sarah leads a team at the moment that is about establishing targeted large scale projects that provide um, people with training and jobs in the sector, meeting and, and marrying that with, with organisations um, and the sector's need for workforce. Sarah has also, prior to that, um, had a whole range of um, jobs and, and public sector roles, leadership roles, both at, a, at state government and at a Commonwealth government level. So both of them have extensive experience to bring to this conversation. Thank you very much for joining me today, Kath and Sarah. You can unmute now. <laughs> Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks, Michaela. It's great to be here. Yeah. Thanks, Michaela. It's a pleasure. Um, and so also, look, go. just we'll, I'll take the opportunity as well to say thank you very much for having us and also to acknowledge that I'm dialing into you from Rwandri country. Uh, just acknowledge that the Rwandri people is the traditional owner of the land that I'm dialing into you from. And acknowledge their elders past, present and emerging. Thanks, Sarah. So just a little bit of house kicking before I get you to kick off. Um, for all of those people who are in the audience, and I wish we were all sitting in a room together, that will happen again one day, but what we're able to do by doing these live in, in people's lunchtime is to get a whole lot more people um, give, given access to this conversation than we, if everyone had to travel to get here. There's a chat function. If you put your questions into the chat function, I will weave those as I, you know, as I can into the conversation with Sarah and Kath. So feel free 
the whole way through whenever you've got something you'd like to to put to, into the conversation or for me to ask Sarah and Kath, please just chuck it in the chat um, and, and we'll add it to the conversation. I'd like to get the two of you because I know that you've worked together and separately in government, but one of the examples that we talked about when we were thinking about this chat was the work that you've both done, you both were involved in um, about from the Victorian government's perspective about the introduction of the National Disability Insurance Scheme. I don't want to talk so much about the National Disability Insurance Scheme per se, but the process of developing up and influencing and informing the Victorian state government's response to what is, you know, one of the most major reforms in any of our lifetime, really. Um, and both of you had pretty critical roles in that. So really keen to hear your perspectives of, as that, as a, as a live example of working alongside and engaging with government. Kath, do you want to pick that off? Thanks, Michaela. Um, and I too, uh, I'm not far from Sarah on Wurundjeri land, and I recognise that that land was never ceded. Um, so pay respects to those elders. Um, I think I've got two words really to talk about uh, engagement, engagement with government and what that experience showed me. Um, the first one is as individuals or as communities, um, there's always a space and there should be a space made by government to have co-design with stakeholders. And that was certainly something that we experienced and prioritised during that time. But the second one is audacity. Um, people have the right to have the audacity to ask for the resources of government. Um, and as I went for my walk around Princes Park yesterday, I was thinking about this, um, as you do. Um, taxes and government exist to support the people for when it's raining and they need support. We don't live in an equal society and some people need a little bit of extra help to have the opportunities to live a fulfilling life, whether that's someone with disability, whether that's someone who has experienced family violence, um, whether it's someone that needs a help up through the welfare system whilst they're trying to gain employment to better themselves. And taxes and governments exist to assist those people that aren't as fortunate. And to have the audacity to say that I deserve as a citizen to have that access to support is something that not everyone has. Um, and in fact, don't know what government might be able to do to assist them. And certainly throughout the rollout of the NDIS, the principle of being able to give support to people that needed it was the baseline principle. And if you needed it, you should get what you deserve. Um, but we saw throughout that process, some people that did have the ability to um, work their way through the, um, the environment of government and the scaffolding of government and others that don't. And so I think my um, experience was, um, you know, it's okay to write a letter. It's okay to ring a minister's office. It's okay to ask your local member of parliament to advocate on your behalf. It's okay to advocate for the people that you are working with who are clients of the family violence um, system. It's also okay to advocate on behalf of you as a professional to government about what um, resources the sector should have. And so to have that audacity uh, doesn't mean that you need to pad the, the um, carpet of, of Canberra, um, though you can if you want to, um, but to know that it is your right to ask for those resources and to engage. Yeah, and I think, Kath, that's a really interesting point too. When you think about what is it that actually, what are the things, the levers that affect significant change, right? How how did we get a Royal Commission into family violence? And it's usually a whole series of things, isn't it? It's the, it's the individual. It's the individual who's got the audacity and, you know, like a dog with a bone will keep asking and write letters and do things. It's the party structures, it's the government policy development structures. All of those things get get us to the point where we see significant change. So good good reminder. Thanks, Kath. Sarah, do you want to talk about your perspective and, and thoughts about, about that process and that time? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, it's so lovely to be here with Kath because we've had such a 
productive and um, good working relationship over such a period of time across a series of things we've worked on together. And my um, Kath brings that incredible experience of um, very effective advocacy into government and then seeing um, uh, how that advocacy works and is translated through a minister's office to change or to um, delivering the outcomes people need. And um, uh, part of the reason we've worked so well together is I have a more um, uh, kind of central agency experience of the you know, cycles and tools and processes of government. And um, it's sort of the flip side to Kath's very, very correct point that uh, <laughs> um, you've got to get in it to win it and, and not at all be afraid to advocate, but you've also got to have a sense of how the cycles and processes of government work and where your um, uh, agenda or thing you're advocating for or need you think needs to be met fits in how government thinks and works. It's and in some ways, I know we probably, if we're engaging with um, family violence community sector, telling you a bit how to suck eggs on that government side, because we know you deal with government all day and manage complex relationships, whether you're as a service provider or a um, advocate for change. Uh, but it's uh, so important if you're going in to understand um, things like the budget cycle and where where what you are advocating for might fit in terms of where government is in a budget cycle and therefore are you advocating at the right point to uh, influence a funding investment or is what you're advocating for needing um, uh, significant legislative reform therefore what do you need to understand about the cycle of how legislation is drafted um, uh, the balance of power in the upper house what it would take to have your reform really um, uh, live through that uh, challenging and robust process uh, thinking about how what you're advocating for might fit um, in the election cycle. So, uh, and, and this is all right, I think, for me to talk about as a public servant, because public servants also support both parties in the lead up to elections with a, a, advice about implementation of their policies. If you're thinking about advocacy um, for a really significant change, uh, that sort of pre-election policy planning process starts much sooner than you would think. And if you're talking iconic uh, or significant policy change, it's important to have an idea about how the parts of government you're engaging with, whether they're department or ministerial office, are thinking about that time frame and cycle. So um, for Kath and I, and, the, and we could talk more, I could go on forever about it, <laughs> but the various ways to, to tap into those processes and to think about how you're, what you're advocating for uh, needs to be cognizant of as you engage both with departments and with ministers and with governments. Um, for Kath and I and that experience with the NDIS, it was a bringing together a combination of um, uh, a minister and a minister's office very, very deeply committed to uh, making sure the way the state approached the NDIS really, really was deeply embedded in the needs of people who needed an NDIS um, to deliver on its full potential. And for me, from a more central agency position, thinking through um, how does the state form up its position in relation to that and formalise it through the processes of government. So that meant we um, needed to uh, develop up a framework for thinking about how government would um, approach the NDIS and take it through a cabinet committee to have that formalised. We needed to think about the budget cycle and if the state's contribution to the NDIS was going to be formalised through that budget cycle, how do we need to think about that in terms of timing and what expectations we set on the Commonwealth as that funding transition to the Commonwealth. So there's always a um, bringing together of your advocacy mission and your sense of clarity and purpose as you advocate in and how that relates to the, the mechanics and machinery of government to make sure you can get the best out of that advocacy process. And, and Michaela, I know you've got lots more questions, but in that um, in that tag team that Sarah and I can do, um, the overtly political angle to that as well is to think about who those influences are to those political parties, whether you whether there's an opportunity, no matter who and which party you're talking to, is there an opportunity for advocacy of the opposition because the opposition are wanting to craft certain policies 
uh, and put pressure on governments from, from opposition during an election campaign, who are the people that will influence them uh, and who are the people that government is currently listening to because they have stakeholders of their own that are pressure points as well. And I'm thinking, you know, various community organisations might have the ear of governments more so than others. Um, organisations like trade unions, for instance, with the Labor Party being who they are, they are very key influences. And throughout the NDIS, the trade union movement was an incredibly um, in integral part to um, both the way that the NDIS was advocated for, the way that they worked with stakeholders themselves, but obviously, um, you know, you'll get a different response from a Labor government and a, and a Greens opposition party, uh, minority parties, um, and, and vice versa, finding some of those um, pressure points and, and business groups and influences within the coalition side of politics to leverage your arguments and work in coalition with. Um, you know, if I cast my mind back even to the work choices um, campaigns for, for workplace rights, churches became incredibly important um, as ways to um, have trusted voices talk to people about their working conditions. Um, and, and they got involved in a political process where they often wouldn't. Um, but who are those groups then that you can work with in tandem with um, to further your goals is, um, you know, all political parties have their weaknesses. And do you think, Kat, I've been reflecting a bit on the flip side of that is, who a big reform like work choices or NDIS or Gonski education reform, sometimes um, there's a coalition of interest and advocates and such a deep, clear need that that advocacy that, um, comes together. Sometimes people we're chatting with and have dialed in today might be thinking, how do I, um, uh, the, the mission of my organisation, my advocacy purpose, how do I elevate that in government's thinking? It, it's not top of their list of um, what's what's uh, uh, got a lot of momentum or a lot of advocacy around it. Um, and I think um, I'd be really interested in your reflections on that, Kat, how you build momentum if your mission is not top of people's minds. I, th I think that's where it, that's where you ask for champions. Um, and, I, and I do go back to some of the simplest forms of advocacy and, um, and engagement where you are able to knock on the door of your local representative, whether you voted for them or not, and talk through your issue, your story, your, in, your intense expertise. You are the expert of your own life and the people around you that you're advocating for. I think that's why the NDIS movement was ultimately a success because the real people and the real stories and the gut-wrenching experiences of families um, had to win the day and they found advocates from all angles but if even if it was your local member who was then able to um, you know uh, talk to ministers or talk to the local paper on your behalf and build that momentum um, you know that's incredibly powerful um, because when they're when they're honest and they're real stories, you, you can't not be affected by that. And I do think, um, you know, by people like Bill Shorten, who at the time, um, you know, uh, was a um, what's the word? Um, just a just a shadow minister started to listen to those stories. And I do say that in in. Um, inverted commas, um, but it hit, a, it hit a chord with him and he has been a very strong advocate ever since. Um, and at the time he wasn't the person with power. Um, but equally, um, you know, the, the lineup between the Productivity Commission, um, who, who overwhelmingly that experience and the stories that came through built that overwhelming evidence that they who are economically conservative could see that the economics worked of an insurance scheme being the, the thing that would deliver change and, and the need was so great that it had to be done. Um, I think that was incredible. Same with paid parental leave, the Productivity Commission saw that on the balance of economics, let alone right and wrong, 
uh, women deserved to be paid while they had children and recovered from birth. Um, and economically, it was the right thing to do. So, um, yes, finding those champions that can then go up the chain for you, um, I think, is pretty critical. And I also reckon, Kath, do you think for, say, an organiser, say it's, you've um, got your way in either to the department or the minister and you're making your case for, for what it is that is the reform you're driving or the, the need you think is there or the pilot you're interested in pursuing, um, that um, making sure you, exactly as you're describing, Kath, at a macro level, um, while being true to your um, proposal and the evidence that underpins it and the mission you're on, really trying to think through how your what you're advocating for fits into what government is signalling as its priorities through the way it's setting budgets, the way it's speaking about its priorities, the way so that you can find those alignments um, and uh, position yourself and what might be something that's come up through your clients, through that for you there is overwhelming evidence of a need but isn't yet registering with government. Um, how do you make the connection between those set of government priorities and what you see as an urgent and critical imperative for government to get its head around? And that's about um, uh, really reading that broader environment and really um, uh, understanding what government is signaling about its priorities. You've, you, you've got to do your homework. Um, and, you know, sometimes it's not comfortable. It feels a little bit dirty even um, to do things like, and I have done this a lot over the last uh, couple of years. Um, do your Google search on the MP or the minister that you want to talk to. Find out what their history and their background is. Um, what organisations did they work for in the past? What influences them? Um, uh, ha have a little bit of a, a search of their first speeches to parliament. Um, you know, the I I've sort of said a couple of times to, to this group and others that have come before this group, um, I think there are a couple of different ways that politicians or people that get involved in politics are motivated. Some are motivated by the pursuit of power and it doesn't matter which party they're involved in, they are across all. Um, and so things that will create a legacy or aligning with um, something that allows them to shine and have the limelight is, is sometimes something you need to play up to. Is there a great news story from your organisation that you can invite that MP to come out and have a look at what's happening um, with the people that you work with, that they can get a happy snap into the, a newspaper and further their, um, their their persona within within their chosen field? You know, it works for them and it will work for you. You're allowed to do it. Um, but equally, finding out that the person that you're talking to actually has worked for 20 years um, in social housing and actually is incredibly driven by the same outcomes that you're after, you know, grabbing that moment um, to speak to them um, in that detailed way about the ins and outs of the work that you're doing will use that opportunity if you know that that's their background. Equally, if they have absolutely no knowledge whatsoever in your sector, um, take the opportunity to, to, to go for the heart and to really tell those heartfelt stories because you might just find that they've got um, a family member or, or, or some other connection that you can connect with. And I think that's really worthwhile. Uh, and probably, Michaela, the other thing that um, I should stress at that point is when you're in front of government, decision makers, departments, remember to put an ask on the table. Don't just come in and tell a nice story. You have to ask for what you want, why you're there. What do you want? Um, that person to do? Um, is it about um, money? We'll put that on the table. Is it about a different process that you need them to engage with? Then put that ask on the table because the worst thing you can do is walk out of a 30 minute meeting and go, well, I don't know what they want. Uh, they're, they're a great organisation, but I don't know how to help them. Yeah. The and other thing I'm thinking listening sorry to the two of you is that there's the mapping of the of your stakeholders and who are the influencers and your and your potential champions Kath but the point that 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 the, the richness of what you're sharing 
um, both of you is who are the people that you know that you could go and say, hey, this is what my ask is. Do you think it's reasonable? Is it too big? Is it too small? Is it achievable? Is it aligned with government current priorities? Am I using the right language? So there might be people in your network who they're not themselves going to be able to help you with the ask. Um, they're not going to be able to deliver, you know, whatever it, on, on what you, it is you want, but they might be able to, if what you say to them is, listen, I know you're not going to be able to get this funding for me or, or get this pilot up, but can you help steer me in the right direction? Could you give me some feedback on what, the, what, what it is that we're pitching or what the ask is? People are often very happy if they, they'll be nervous if they think that you're coming to them, so, that you're going to solve their problem. But if you're coming to the some, for some advice, they'll be very happy to give you advice um, for that. I think that's spot on, Michaela. And in fact, what I was going to say, the flip side to the um, uh, advocacy Kath is describing is that trusted set of relationships. And particularly as a, as a um, recovering staffer and public servant myself, uh, um, developing we never those, recover, Sarah. <laughs> developing those um, trusted relationships with public servants who um, can give you that insight and advice. Um, our our obligation is to understand the landscape. We want to know what the issues and dynamics are, and that means you might. It's worth having conversations before you have an ask. You don't. The conversations don't always have to be around an ask. And um, the sharing of that really important intelligence about what's happening, what pressure points are, issues, opportunities, is a real value, I think, to both public service and to the sector to be sharing, exchanging. And that helps you build the trusted relationship that lets you, as you say, Michaela, uh, me, or it lets a public servant be honest with you and say, um, I could just send you off to Coro and get your letter back saying thanks and have a look at the website. Um, but honestly, I don't think what you're, where you're at right now aligns and here's what would align or here's what we know government expects of us in the delivery of this program or service. Have a think about that, you know, that yeah. type of, yeah, trusted exchange of, of um, insights and uh, evidence. I want to go back, Sarah, to some of your points about understanding the cycle and the machinery of government kind of processes and just to talk a little bit about the very different world that we find ourselves in now, right? We've had two, the last two budget cycles very interrupted and operating in a very different way than because we all knew what this was what the cycle was and this is the month that you start kind of you know talking about x and it will go before cabinet in whatever month the world is very different now and it's hard to see you know how it will go back can you talk a little bit about that about what it what your experience and, and we know also that we're just about to lead into end of next year. So the, what's the election kind of, we're about to head into 12 months out before another election cycle as well. So what what is it that is, what is it you are seeing is different now about those cycles and what can people do about that? Good question. And it, um, <laughs> I think in Chatham House, House rules, there wouldn't be anyone dealing with government at the moment or anybody just, um, existing and conscious in Victoria and in Australia that um, I'm not giving away any secrets to say exactly as you said, Michaela, that, that those cycles are um, uh, understandably and uh, probably appropriately disrupted by the need to, you know, manage and prioritise the pandemic response. It means, um, uh, you know, probably appropriately uh, cabinet decision making is much more rapid. There's a less uh, um, uh, critical decisions clearly need to be prioritised and there is a rapid lead in time to those. Um, uh, similarly, kind of businesses, usual activity um, remains critical. Interestingly, while the pandemic I think is, is focusing down um, government focus and decision making. It's really clear that the pandemic affects almost every workplace, every industry. And so, in fact, government is 
um, from my what my vantage point, um, especially in our department and in um, DFFH, investing a huge amount of effort in thinking through how business as usual um, works and is safe in that environment. So um, while it could be read as a contraction of focus and effort, I think it is at the very pointy decision making level and that cabinet decision making cycle is much more rapid, but at the same time, um, I think the COVID overlay um, is creating some opportunities in business as usual activity as government thinks through how either they are safely operated, how they underpin, particularly in the community service sector, um, people's well-being and um, making it through the recovery. So uh, I would say it's all just an imperative to be <laughs> more active rather than less in what you think is needed or um, uh, the environment will move really fast. So those trusted relationships and the intelligence you can gather about how and when decisions are being made and how you would feed into them, I think are more important than ever. Um, I think also, like it's clear that just across society, we're going to be in a bit of a reactive um, and unpredictable until, you know, we're vaccinated to the, to the level that we need to be. It is everything we do on a day-to-day -day basis is going to need to be um, what will inevitably be a bit disrupted and a bit reactive. And so I think that just amps up the imperative to make good connections in <laughs> um, and be gathering kind of the best intelligence you can about how and when to get into that cycle. Which is actually a relationships and vibe answer, Michaela, rather than yeah. a process answer, which is yeah. what you're asking me for. But um, <laughs> no, no. So yeah, I, I, that's right. Okay. And 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 probably about thinking in that you know doing your homework, thinking through how might anything that you are seeking um, connect to both money is flowing. How can it, how can you tap into those things? But we're having a conversation, or at least I hope we're having a conversation about um, what what does build back better look like? You know, there, there's been there's COVID normal, there's pre-COVID normal, um, and are we seriously going to learn the lessons of COVID about that inequality that it has shown about? whether we do value certain workforces that we deemed were essential during the pandemic and um, do we think through some of the crises, mental health and violence and otherwise that, that were amplified um, during that time. And, and therefore, those conversations might be happening in departments, they might be happening in political parties, they might be happening at the local council level um, and and to try and work out how your thing aligns aligns with that. Um, without giving a specific example, there is a particular thing that RMIT has achieved with the Victorian government as a result of the pandemic and the Victorian government deciding that they would try and fund some investment in universities where it's not the normal um, role uh, in federation for a state government to fund directly universities. Um, but we've been able to achieve something in that um, because uh, we, the government and, and the sector had to think creatively about what, what does seeing a pandemic and the economic impact, what does that look like and how do we see that through? Um, and and some risks and some opportunities were taken um, and you, you had to be at the right place at the right time, sure, but you also had to know that your narrative and your um, principles were um, contributing to that conversation and that desire from government. I think that point about um, things moving faster, being a bit more flat, you know, there is a much more openness to uh, doing some things differently and ideas about responding to what some of the critical issues are that are facing the community and this sector in particular 
in a way that there's there's moments to be seized. I think that's the other thing kind of that you've both talked about is seizing the moment and framing what you're interested in up with regard in regard to priorities and what's being talked about. So this workforce, the social service community sector workforce is is absolutely a priority. And one of the things that has been really evident um, because of the impact of the pandemic is stuff that people have been talking about for a long time. The impact of not being funded enough to pay wages properly so that people are working in jobs that are insecure, often multiple jobs. And what's so it's not new, those things, but there is definitely a moment to kind of seize some of that. You, either of you, that's a really good example, Kath, of um, that kind of moment being seized. And you can see when um, other players have done that as well. Other other thoughts about about that, about what's what what so maybe Sarah a bit about what are the priorities of government? What are the things that you know it's it, you can talk about? Because very aware of you are an, you are a public servant, and that does um, that does mean you need to bring that keep that hat on when you're talking today. But what are the things that people should be thinking about in terms of government priorities and um, where there might be some leverage? Um, I would definitely say, let me make some observations, both from my individual role, but definitely not claiming to. Uh, authoritatively articulate the priorities of government, but some um, yeah. both from the role I'm in and uh, the themes we can see emerging from government. Um, notwithstanding our most recent lockdown, all of us, I think, have the great hope that we're in a recovery phase post pandemic. And so, um, you know, a jobs lens and a workforce lens on how um, getting people into work and uh, both for, you know, the critical impact on their well-being and society of having people in work, but also meeting um, a range of um, workforce shortages in your sector, but also across the economy um, is is a really um, critical frame for how we're going to recover as a state, I think, and worth thinking about your um, uh, uh, service need and imperatives and your clients needs and imperatives through that kind of workforce and jobs lens and what the opportunities are there to tell a job story in your workforce and service narrative. Um, I also think through, um, despite the pandemic, I think I would observe that multiple royal commissions are um, reinforcing um, a frame that has been well known to the community service sector for a very long time around both um, the Family Violence Royal Commission and the Mental Health Royal Commission around um, the whole person and um, the support that needs to go around uh, a client as a person. And I think that is a theme um, that uh, is gaining momentum across government in terms of how we wrap around people and deliver um, services in the way they need. I also think, again, another narrative that I think this sector has known for a very long time and been advocating very hard on for a very long time, but I see gaining um, uh, momentum and, and traction is um, the early intervention and prevention frame of uh, investment. And I think that we know it, or you know it inherently as a um, what it means for an individual and what it means for a society if we um, intervene early and prevent a range of um, uh, negative life experiences for people. But I think also it is double benefit to government in terms of an efficiency story and a return on investment story and, the, you know, wasted money chasing demand growth, um, which I think is gaining increased momentum, I think, in central agencies. And to be totally frank, in Chapman House in this space, there is a reality that at some point over the next coming unpredictable time frame, governments will need to shift from a stimulus phase down to a more, uh, there'll be a, a contraction over Money's time. Gonna, and that early right, intervention. going to run out. Yeah, and that early intervention prevention frame is such a good efficiency story as well as a um, well-being of the person story, I think. 
do, do you think, Sarah, the other one, um, money might be an issue here, but the other one that's kind of been laid bare is this notion of um, thin markets, which we talked a lot about in NDIS, where um, new services, expanding thin markets, tailoring services to local need, but fundamentally around services being provided in place that actually means jobs in regional and smaller centres and jobs for people that haven't had them that enable someone to stay where they are and have a community of support around them, potentially when family members can't pick up that slack anymore, um, has a gendered lens to it as well. Thin, thin markets, regional um, services, staying in place, not having family who can undertake, you know, women who are currently in that sandwich generation looking after young children as well as elderly parents. All of those things could shift if we started that early intervention and investment to build out um, those services. Um, that's a long-term thing that, that again has been ha um, a consideration for some time. But if we're trying to find the jobs that that are there, that, that can be supported and um, talking to the incredible demand that exists for mental health, family violence, ageing, um, just because of the needs of, of the population, um, that's probably another one to tap into. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's bringing together the, um, what you know and have such overwhelming uh, real world exposure to in terms of, um, that service need and the kind of pointy end uh, evidence you can bring for treasuries and central agencies around avoided costs, around level of demand and prevention. Yeah. yeah. I was the going to add one. that one. <laughs> the the Keep best going, example, Kat. Michaela, um, was always uh, an organisation called uh, Young People in Nursing Homes who could give you the costs of someone with a disability whose, whose needs are that extreme, um, that a, a, a stay or a night or an extended stay in hospital um, was, cost X amount. Um, their, their support in a nursing home would cost X amount. And if neither of those two, uh, in fact, if there were proper accommodation and support available for them, um, that over time we would be spending far, far less if we had appropriate accommodation for those people. Yeah, yeah. and they're a teeny tiny org, aren't they, Kat? But they want to be fierce advocates. Well, fierce advocates with good economic arguments, with yeah. a really clear evidence base uh, and and a good story, you know, very, very, very real, genuine stories to tell. I think just to just to circle back around to something you were just saying, talking about, Kath, in terms of the again the impact of and and Sarah, I don't I, I don't know about being post pandemic love. I think it feels very in mid pandemic, and I think yeah, what the world is going to look like for the next 12, 12 months, two years is probably a bit like what the last six months has looked like, kind of, you know, churning. Um, and the very real impact on, on, on individuals about suddenly being locked in play, you know, that, that really, I feel like there's a really interesting tension between the borders and boundaries being opened up because we're doing a lot more stuff online and you can kind of join international conferences now, you can kind of get people regionally and rurally into training that we couldn't before. So tension between borders being opened up and actually much more place-based. People are staying in place. They're shopping in their local, you know, shopping centres. They're not, they're not going into the CBD anymore to do things. They are very, so, and people are having, organisations are having enormous trouble recruiting because of that, you know, whereas you might have been able to get someone you know, to move into state. I was just part of a recruitment process for a position in New South Wales, someone in South Australia who pulled out because they weren't confident they were going to be able to get home to family members, you know, to see family members. Um, they were happy to move, but if I can't get home and see, you know, 
um, other family members, I'm, not, I, I'm, she withdrew at the very last minute. So there's tensions around uh, and interest around solving problems. So we've got new problems, new opportunities, and interest in solving that. So when we talk about place-based, it's a slightly different thing now. Yeah, Sarah, do you you've got reflections based on on the conversations you've been part of because of that? Because jobs, precincts, and regions. It's definitely been part of the, dis the department's um, interest and area of how do we create precincts? How do we think about that stuff differently? Yeah, and I think you've hit the nail on the head, Michaela, that it couldn't be more real and tangible right now, how place functions in our life, which it was, as you say, bizarrely, while we're both operating internationally and cross borders, our physical lives are now so um, in a specific spot that place becomes more real and tangible than ever. And I think that's um, basically you and Kath have hit the nail on the head. It's so significant for service design and how we, how, for example, in the implementation of the Mental Health Royal Commission, they work through what service in a service model in place looks like so people can get the services where they need it. And for us at Jobs Victoria, we're very interested across all of this, all of that discussion in how we create jobs in place. And we, we, um, connect people that need jobs into those workforce opportunities. Um, yeah, but beyond saying, I think you've hit that nail on the head, Michaela. Um, uh, it couldn't be a more real and tangible uh, way of thinking and working at the moment. Yeah. So, in summary, and then Kath, your thoughts about this, you were talking, we kind of talked about the, just in on that question, priorities. Jobs, jobs led recovery, thinking about you know mental health and um, and I and I think safety. I do think kind of family violence and what's happening in that space and place, place and thinking about location and how we think about that as as priorities. I think Kath, the other one that I know we think about from an RMIT kind of learning that that how do you create pathways? How do you help people? How do you help people transition? And I know government are thinking about this. So circling back round to the, the question about influencing and engaging with government and, and in terms of furthering the things that are dear to your heart, all of, all of us about from an advocacy perspective. Any other, any thoughts about those priorities, Kath, or, or this discussion to add? Well, that, that, that an, an integral part of, if we're going to be talking about jobs, 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 um, and you did say the, 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 the word there, lifelong, is um, the role of education in any, any skills-led recovery. Um, and we have been talking for some time um, around a, a kind of terrifying but also exciting concept of what, what is called the 60-year curriculum, which actually says um, there's not many people into the future that are going to do their undergraduate degree, if they do a degree at all, um, when they're 20 and never do any formal tra um, training or education after that point and go off into a 40 year career. The, the points in time where reskilling, upskilling, that the pandemic has shown us um, opportunities to totally change your career or slightly change your career in ways that don't disrupt the most important thing for you at the time, which is continuing to earn a wage. How can you do that lifelong learning um, in a way that is integrated within your workplace and your work, working day and life. Um, and models that FISI are pursuing at the moment around higher apprentices um, and, and different ways that we can do short courses um, and the like um, that enable uh, workforces to, to shift and grow in those roles over time um, is incredibly important. Uh, but this notion of a 60 year curriculum, which is really important to that, um, and I remember going to a seminar where someone said, uh, a very smart person from the US said that they've actually done some modelling about the lifespan now, that they believe that the first person who will live to be 150 has been born. Now that terrifies me because I'd really like to retire sometime soon. Um, but that, that working career, that life cycle um, requires so much more um, economic investment from individuals from employers from the government in order to um 
to, to fill those services and the need that exists both for the community but for ourselves to earn a wage, um, that's pretty critical. We've got about 10 minutes left, so I really want to encourage if anyone's got any questions or any comments you'd like to make, stick them in the chat and we'll kind of kind of can open that up to any any questions you'd like me to put to Sarah or Kath. Kath, what you've just talked about then too made me think about the, you know, there's the there's a number of different ways to cut the priorities, right? And to be thinking about it. The other thing that we know is real, really important um, and that government are very much thinking about is the impact of the pandemic on young people, right? We've got a whole bunch of young people all the way down to primary school age kids whose schooling is interrupted, young people entering the workforce. And, and then the other that, that has been a priority, particularly Victoria, and that's partly been about the way the Commonwealth's um, response to the pandemic is women over 45. So though, so so it's also um, parts of the community that that have been important. Um, any comments on that? Oh, look, that with my jobs Victoria had on, and I've been resisting the urge to do a uh, pitch to you all about both our <laughs> service offering and government's expectations for how we will support um, people, job seekers across a range of. Um, circumstances but uh, government has been very very clear with Jobs Victoria that uh, women over 45 are a key key priority group for us to get into work um, uh, because of what the overwhelming evidence tells us about the sectors that um, many women over 45 are working in and were so significantly affected and continue to be you know um, contracted um, uh, the way traditional forms of government stimulus might not reach them as a group, you know, building another um, uh, various levels of government priority and uh, stimulus investments don't reach that, reach that group. And uh, they are uh, such a, um, you know, firstly at risk of permanent exit from the workforce, but um, as someone in this or close to in this group myself have, um, outstanding life experience, serious work ethic frequently, um, and enormous amount still to contribute. And so a big part of our mission in Jobs Victoria is um, providing employment service support and providing employment pathways for women over 45. Um, and we are really keen to work with this, uh, um, with the sector on this, both because we know the caring workforce has such significant workforce demand, um, uh, you have such significant workforce demand in your sector generally. Uh, and um, yeah, we love, this is not to hijack this conversation, which is about engaging with government, but just to do the Jobs Victoria pitch out. Our mission is to get job seekers into job and jobs and to connect employers with the workers they need. And we know this is really live for this sector, your workforce demand, and also there's um, uh, great opportunity in your sector to grow that workforce to create opportunities for groups like women over 45, for young people who are at risk of that economic scarring, as you say, Michaela, if the, the tail end of their education and their transition into work is disrupted um, for a range of people who we see an economy recovering, but we know there are um, groups for whom that is just not, um, recovery is not reaching them yet. So I've got a couple of two very different questions in the chat so if we can try and cover off on them quickly the first one actually the, se the second one i'm going to relate a bit to what you've just been talking about sarah so i'll go there first but then i'll come back to the second the, the other question which is about do you think government is open to new ways of funding and um and particularly are we going to see more flexible funding opportunities or even funding for wage subsidies or entrepreneurship so so Sarah, I think it's I think it's let, the question is are letting you do a pitch for the approach that government has been taking to job um, job creation and how can we advocate more for more that for more of that effectively is the question. So do you want to talk a bit about in response to that? Yes, fabulous. I promise this wasn't a Dorothy Dixon that I put in, but fabulous. Thank you. Um, I can't see who asked the question on the chat, but um, yes, I think to start at the big. Uh, macro question you pose, yes. I think the pandemic is um, driving different and more flexible ways of working in government. Um, uh, government made a very significant investment into Jobs Victoria, 600 million in that out of cycle um, November 2020 budget. 
uh, that uh, um, I've never uh, worked in the establishment of a, an organisation and a set of services and a set of supports, both for job seekers and employers, um, that had such an eye to uh, delivering the outcome in the most flexible way possible with a real focus on service outcome and quality of service. Um, it's a unique experience for me to work in an environment like that. Um, what that is enabling to go to your specific question um, about wage subsidies and support is let me do the pitch. So <laughs> um, uh, Jobs Victoria kind of has three main threads to its, its bow and the way we are have been tasked by government to support job seekers and connect them into work and support employers to get the work as they need. The first is basically a trebling of the employment service support system to help people um, in a range of circumstances who need help to navigate uh, the employment ecosystem and get either back into work after the pandemic or who might have been facing challenges in employment even before the pandemic. Um, that includes mentors who will provide kind of deep um, job readiness, training, connection uh, and connection into work for job seekers, um, a new workforce of uh, career counsellors that um, can assist people to navigate, uh, you know, a change of career or what skills they might need to develop to pursue employment opportunities, um, a workforce of advocates who are out in a range of environments and in a range of um, organisational settings, uh, helping connect with people who might have trouble navigating the employment service system and connecting them into the services they might need. So a big, big expansion of how government supports people who need help navigating the workforce, uh, navigating the employment service system. Um, uh, the central plank of how we work is the Jobs of Victoria Hub, which is our online um, platform that connects job seekers and employers uh, and also provides a range of tools and supports for job seekers to navigate that system. The part that I look after um, uh, is the $250 million jobs fund. So government's done put two um, uh, ways of working into the fund. Uh, one is immediate wage subsidies. Um, a relatively light touch, low admin um, application process to let employers who need staff access a wage subsidy of between ten and twenty thousand dollars if they're employing a priority job seeker. Um, and then another stream of the fund which aims to do larger scale projects where we are, work with key sectors like yourselves to identify where there's really significant workforce demand that is unmet. Um, because some sectors continue to grow and need a workforce and cannot get it in this time when we have closed borders. Um, uh, and out of the fund, working with um, that industry and key partners in it to invest in the supports and training that priority job seekers need to take up those jobs. So we're very excited about the project we're running with FISI to get um, uh, up to 600 job seekers into jobs in the disability sector by investing in training, wraparound support, um, an earn and learn model, plus a mentoring support that lets people um, take up that opportunity to thrive in what is a new and um, challenging work environment in the disability sector. So we would love to talk to you either if you have some significant workforce demand you'd like to talk to us about meeting or really just to connect you into that wage subsidy model if you um, have a relatively small scale workforce need, but um, are in a position to employ a priority job seeker. So Sarah, we'll put out, we'll put some stuff in the newsletter that goes out as a follow up to this, so that people will, you'll get information about where to go to. Thank you. Mm. The the other the other we've got a couple of minutes, and I'd really like to. Um, there's a question in the chat about uh, advocating um, when so somebody with without as visible a disability. Kath, have you read that question too? And where's where's what about about also why is there a bit of an attitude within government and certain disability and mental health organisations about so I think this is a it, it is a bit of the NDIS rollout um, question about advocating when when maybe you've not got such a visible issue um, to be advocating around. Um, Kath, any thoughts thoughts on on, on that? Yeah, look, I, I think I think the person who's asked the question. Um, one of the things that I was going to say earlier, if you were going to ask for, you know, um, wrap up advice is, um, oh yes, is, is to always remember, you know, to to have to have 
a girl gang, to have support, to have people around you that you're not doing this by yourself um, because no one can. No one can can live the life of a, an activist, an advocate um, and do it by yourself. Um, and it also comes to the question about silos in DFFH and, and D Department of Health across government. Look, I would say that there are some really great organisations out there that encourage and empower self-advocates and self-advocacy um, in the disability so sector and mental health sector. Um, find find a group that works for you. They, they might not... Um, you know, might not be easy to find, but find a group of people that are like-minded that you can go on the journey with, um, whether it's about um, disability services and, and um, self-advocacy, whether it's mental health, uh, whether it's family violence, um, gender, sexuality, any of those things. Find find people that you can feel comfortable with and, and don't go it alone. Um, and in, in a similar vein, I guess, um, how do you stop silos across government? Well, you've got to come at it from different angles and talk to anyone and everyone. Um, you need to remember when you you might be attached to a certain department um, that they they do talk across um, uh, across government. Sometimes not as well as they could. But something that the NDIS did really well was actually say that NDIS is about specialist disability supports for people that need it. But the whole rest of the way that we deliver government support and engage with people with disabilities um, from, from education to public transport to um, arts and entertainment, all of those things have to change as well to make the experience for someone whole. And that meant Department of Transport was involved. It meant that the Premier's office and de the part Department of Premier and Cabinet needs to be involved. Um, the Premier's private office needed to be involved. The Department of Treasury and Finance has to be involved. And there are people at those kind of peak and coordinating organisations um, that, that it is their job to have a, a cross-government lens. So um, asking right to the Treasurer, um, you know, it'll filter down to appropriate people who have that cross-departmental lens, but um, talk to everyone. Um, you're allowed to be the squeaky wheel, um, uh, and and I think um, some really effective change comes from that. I think that's a fabulous note on which we've come to the end of our time, Kath. I'm going to ask both of you to shoot me an email with because I asked you to think about your top three tips, and we'll send that out with the newsletter. So we'll have a follow-up newsletter to this. The recording will be available, so I'll I'll re I'll remind you both, and we'll get so there will be I'll ask for your three top tips. Um, to put it into our newsletter, but but I think Kath, Kath the, the the beginning with the be audacious and the circling back round at the end about be the squeaky be the squeaky wheel, ask everybody write letters, um, and the wisdom Sarah about understand and map the terrain, do your homework, um, work out who the stakeholders are, be aware of government priorities and messages is incredibly useful advice and something that. Even though I've worked in, in this space for quite a while, it's very helpful to be reminded of and be reflected, reflecting on. So thank you very much for your time today. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Buchanan. It's a pleasure. Thank Thanks. you. And, and just a reminder to your audience that um, you are doing a power of work and you're incredibly inspirational and um, you're making the world a better place. Thank you. I certainly are. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.